Hello, my name's Bryden Oliver and I'm an SSW Solution Architect. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you about super fast transactions and we're going to use Cosmos DB and Redis for our examples. So let's dive into it. First, we've got a, a rewards app here at SSW. So if you scan the QR code here, you can sign up to get some rewards and I'll give you a code later on to get some points. So who am I? My name's Bryden Oliver. I'm an SSW solution architect. I've worked with Azure since it was launched in about 2008 or early 2009. I'm a little bit shorter than I was maybe last time you saw me after a, a bit of a trampolining accident. I know an awful lot about Cosmos. I've been working with that a great deal and uh, use that at enormous scale. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you about uh, database locking and then I'm going to have a, a quick chat about how we can do some locking for Cosmos using Redis. Then we'll take a look at some code and then we'll have a look at how that code performed and how that's different to the performance we got with a SQL Server example and then we'll talk about what we can do with that example next. So, what problem are we trying to solve? Well, in Cosmos DB, we can't lock a record. That means the multiple things can happen at once. So that means two people can, can modify a record at once. So that's a problem. Because quite often what you need to do is read a, rec read a value out of a record, maybe add $10 to it, and then update it. So if other people can do that, then that's a big problem for our application. So I'll show you a way to do this type of locking for Cosmos, which doesn't natively support that. So let's have a talk about the backstory to the example we're going to use tonight. So I've been thinking about a lot, of, a lot about the zombie apocalypse, what with COVID-19 and there being a pandemic. How would a zombie apocalypse affect Australia? Well, the other thing that happened was I was um, browsing around on uh, YouTube and I saw the old Marty Monster versus a kangaroo video that's up there. Take a look if you've never seen it. It's Aussie TV gold. So that got me to thinking, well, there's a population model here. So I reckon that the zombies will run around killing all the humans. The humans will get a bit hungry because no one's producing food because they're all busy fighting the zombies. So they'll have to eat kangaroos, catch and eat kangaroos. And those kangaroos, just like they did to Marty Monster in the, the YouTube video, will kill the zombies. So that gives us a beautiful population model that works on the, the relative populations of our kangaroos, our humans, and our zombies. And we'll apply that in a particular city. And we'll have a, a long list of cities. So we've got a, a nice population model where we're trying to do update it quickly and do simulations. And while these enormous and complex calculations we need to be sure that another instance of our simulation doesn't come along and update that record and change the population while we're trying to change it. So what do we need to be able to do here? We need to be able to lock the data for one particular city. And we're going to demonstrate how we do that. First, we're going to show a SQL Server solution. So we've got a, an example of that. And we've also got an example using Cosmos. For those days, you really need a NoSQL solution. Like if you've got big documents that you needed to, to, to write and you just needed to, to lock something in there. And that uses Cosmos SQL. So we've talked about what the problem we're, we've been trying to solve is. Now let's have a, a quick look at database locking because that's really at the heart of what we're talking about here. So first, we've got Cosmos DB, which is what we're going to demonstrate with today. 
So Cosmos DB is a super fast document database. And by document database, we mean typically JSON documents. So it's really fast at being able to store a document and give it back to you and do queries on things that are in those documents. What else does it have? It's really easy to replicate. So if I want, if I've got a copy here in uh, Sydney and I want a copy in Brisbane and Melbourne, it's basically a couple of checkboxes in the, the UI or a single deploy and Cosmos will automatically replicate that. So that's much simpler than all of the other database solutions that are out there. It stores JSON documents, as I've already said, but for all, those, all of that um, speed and replication, we lose some features. And the primary one there is it's really hard to lock stuff when it's replicated in multiple locations. So you've lost the feature of being able to lock data while, you, while you've got that replication. So sometimes you really just need that. So, and you may only need that, you may be using Cosmos for a big application and maybe one of the records types needs locking. So you don't wanna to have to go to a solution that supports locking just to, to do that because then you're losing all the benefits of Cosmos had over your other solution. So let's have a chat about what locking in databases actually does and what it means. So we have locking in databases and the reason we have locking in databases is because the consistency of our data, data is really important. And to be able to keep that consistent and to manage that nicely we need lots of different types of locks. And our locks can be applied to different things in a database. And we'll have a look at that for using SQL Server as an example shortly. And some of these locks actually have different effects on what's happening. So let's take a look at SQL Server in particular. So it's got a locking hierarchy. So you can lock things at four levels of granularity. There are some others, but these are the primary ones that SQL Server uses. So you can lock an entire database, or if you don't need to lock that much data, you can lock a table, or if you needed to lock something smaller, you could lock a page, or if you were just updating a single record, you could lock just that record or that row, as they call it. The other cool thing in SQL Server is if you've got, say, a row level lock, so you've done, you're in a transaction and you've updated a row, and then you update a couple of other rows, it can escalate that lock to a higher type. So it can escalate from a row lock up to a page lock. So it can say, oh, he's modified a couple of things in the same page. So I'm modifying, say, five rows in the single page it'll update to the upgrade your row lock to a page lock or even a table lock if you start modifying everything in the table or even the database if that's needed, which is very rare. It's very rare to have to lock the entire database. Typically that's for things like backups and particularly a restore will have a right lock on your entire database. So as well as being able to lock things at different levels, we get different types of locks. And the reason we have this is so that we can get the consistency and performance balance right. And SQL Server has a lot of different types of locks. There's a, well, there's well over 10 the last time I looked, but we'll just discuss the two really important ones for day-to-day -day use. So first of all, you've got an exclusive lock and the name here gives it away a bit. So what that will do, it will make that resource only available for the person who holds that lock, which is typically a transact inside a transaction. So normally you would say for the transaction holder. So anyone else other than the holder of that lock has to wait for you to unlock it before they can do anything that is in whatever resource you've, you've locked. 
So that's quite a problematic lock if you've got lots of those. If you've got lots of those in your database, exclusive locks can be quite problematic. So there's a different level of lock, which is much less um, restrictive, and it's called a shared lock. So this lock will make the resource only available for reading. So if I take out a shared lock on, say, a row, other people can read that row, but they can't write to it because I've got it. And I might be reading it, and then I'm going to write it back. So I want it to not have changed between it being read and written back. So all of the transactions, other than the holder of the lock, can only read. But given that the majority of, uh, uh, of code being executed in a SQL Server is reads, that means generally this one isn't blocking anyone. So that's a great lock to use if, you can, if your code can rather than an exclusive lock. And in this lock, only the transaction holder can write to that row. No one else can touch it. So that's the other key thing when this, you've got one of these locks. So I've used the word transactions a bit and most people have heard of them. And really they're controlling the length of time these locks are held. That's the primary thing that they're actually doing. So how do we control that locking from our code? And how do we control what types of locks are given? So there's two ways, like for instance, if you do an update, typically SQL Server will behave in one way or a different way. However, transaction isolation levels give us even more control on what types of locks are given, are taken by our code. So there's four type, main types of transaction isolation. So first, we'll talk about read uncommitted. So that, when we've got read uncommitted transaction isolations, that means transactions may read changes that haven't even been committed to the database. So that means if you've done a, someone else has opened a transaction and they've updated a row but they haven't hit commit yet, so it's not even written back to the table properly, you can read that, even though it may never get written to the database. So there's no transaction isolation at all there. You can read data that may never reach the database, but there's very little, there's almost no locking in this situation, so it's really, really, really fast. So, that one's not used very often because normally people want to read back data that will end up in the database. So then you get to read committed. So that means any data that you read has been committed. So as you can see, that's a little bit more restrictive and you've got to have lock records for reading if you've made a write so that people wait and find out whether you've written it or not. So the next major SQL Server locking type is what's called a repeatable read. So what that does is means that if I make a change, then I will always be able to read back the values I've written. So it avoids what are called non-repeatable reads where I read something, something happens in my transaction, I read it again, and it's different. It shouldn't be different. It should be the same if I've read it twice in the one transaction. And this avo is avoided because the write lock that's been taken prevents any reading. And then the final one, and this is the highest isolation level, it guarantees transactions appear to be executing one by one. So that means one after the other. So if I'm modifying something, not every, it will behave as if everyone has waited for me to, to do my work and then I hand it on to the next person. In reality, if we're not looking at the same data, a database server will let us do things in parallel and stuff, but 
as far as it appears from the outside, it's guaranteed that it will behave as if they were done one after another. So you won't be able to tell that they're being done in parallel. That one is quite slow. And commonly that, that's the one banks will always, almost always use for financial transactions. And that's why they can have quite slow databases. So now we understand a bit about database locking. Let's have a think about our locking for Cosmos, because we've got no locks there. And really, we want to do some locking. And of course, Cosmos deliberately chose not to have any locking. And you know, there's a bunch of reasons why. It allows Cosmos to, to be really fast, really simple. So if you actually go and look at the architecture of Cosmos, it's actually really simple. And it replicates across regions really, really well. But sometimes you just want to lock something. And it may only be one record or something in your Cosmos database. But what are we going to do about that? How can we get locks? Well, the best distributed lock, so a lock available on a network that I'm aware of, is Redis. It provides fantastic distributed locks. They're really, really fast. They're really easy to implement. So we can still be highly scalable. We can have our stateless Pi 2 because Azure supports has a, a, a Redis cache available as an offering. AWS does too. So anywhere we want to use these types of locks, we can. They're even available in a simple container. So you can just download a container with Redis on it and utilize this type of locking. So they're super fast. So they're about the fastest caching algorithm, distributed cache I've ever seen. And they're really easy to implement. So here's the architecture, the demonstration that you'll be able to download later uh, users. So we've got a, a Redis cache used for our locking. We've got our data stored in Cosmos, and then we're using as your functions for the compute, because they're really easy to write. They're really easy to deploy as well. So there won't be too much uh, stuff around with the deployment when you, you take a look at the code. So what would our code to do the locking do? So first, we make a call and obtain the lock from Redis. Then we do stuff like read the record from Cosmos, do what we want to it, and of course, finally, we'll release our lock. And once we've done that, we can have fun and make all of the profit we need. Now it's time to, to start taking a look at some code. So the first thing with all of this sort of code is it's really important to be able to know how long things are taking. So the timings, they're a critical part of our solution is knowing that our locking isn't causing problems. So SQL Server, this is quite often really hard. This is why people find databases hard to use because if they, they've got a slow query, it's actually really hard to find out why. But we're building our own locking here, so we can try and do better and provide something really easy for us, us to use. And because we're talking about um, Azure Cosmos, we'll look, use Azure Application Insights. And Application Insights tracks timings really nicely. It's really easy to understand what happens inside requests. And as you'll see in the, the diagram there, or the screenshot there, it's really easy to see that we've got one request and inside that there's another request and then inside that there's some other requests and various things. You've got a nice Gantt chart of how long each piece of the process takes. The other thing with Application Insights is it's super easy to extend. So I was going to take, 
here, we're going to take the, the Azure Application Dependency Collection and we're going to make it a bit smarter. Right now, you've got to create it and there's an awful lot of boilerplate with it. So if we make this, make a class that implements iDisposable, then we can let the garbage collector magically do our work for us. So let's take a look at that. So if we look here, we've got a class called dependency and that's going to wrap an application insights dependency. So what are we going to do? So we saw in that diagram before, we've got a type, so we'll pass that in, an operation, so that's the thing we were going to do. And then optionally, we can provide an ID. So that means we could even know which record in the database we were trying to lock and what we were trying to do to it. And if we look here, we create a new dependency telemetry, set all the properties on it, and then we start the operation. So as soon as we finish this constructor, we've got a piece of, we've got a, a telemetry, a dependency telemetry ready to go. It's already timing for us. We've then got this success property. So if we want to, we can just set success to false if whatever was going on failed. And then here's the magic. At the end, when we drop out of our using statement, it will automatically do the stop operation and clean up. So what we've really done is turned the majority of this code, which was boilerplate in our application, into a nice, simple operation. And then if we, we can even extend further and um, build a factory for this where we've just got a get dependency method where we just pass object type, operation and ID in. And we'll see how we use that a bit later. So now we've looked at how we can uh, get some good timings out of that. Now we want to start actually building some locking. So we're going to use the redlock.net NuGet package. That's a great little uh, open source package. It wraps the Redis cache distributed lock object nicely. So all we need to do is set up a red lock factory in our dependency injection. So let's take a very quick look at what was required to get that going. So if we look in our dependency injection configuration here, all we had to do was set up all this boilerplate here, which basically just identifies where our Redis has been deployed. So we go and find the connection string and create a multiplexer because you can have multiple cache instances. And then we just create a red lock factory. And that's our, our red lock factory. So that's how easy it is to get that into the dependency injection. Let's see how we would use it in a transaction. So the red lock factory has basically two methods. The first method is create lock async, which will asynchronously try and get us a lock. And it's got a few parameters, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then the second one is we've got redlock.dispose. So redlock is uh, the, the lock, is the variable that the, the lock that's been returned by create lock async has given us back. And we can just dispose of that at the end. And that will release the lock for us. So let's have a think about those three parameters we've got on the create lock async. There's an expiry parameter, a wait parameter, and a retry parameter. So there's quite a bit of control here. So let's talk about expiry. Because so, uh, when I was reading these, I looked at them and I found it slightly unclear what they might mean just from reading the, the parameters. So it's worth actually thinking about what we're talking, what these things mean. So the red lock expiry describes how long the lock should be held 
without any further interaction from the holder. So that means if your app crashes, any lock you've taken out will release. So if you say the lock should be held for with an expiry of 60 seconds, that lock goes away 60 seconds after you got the lock. So that means if you take too long, your application crashes, there's all sorts of reasons why you might want that lock, why that lock might expire. But this is potentially different to things like SQL Server where they'll just hold the lock indefinitely. Typically, a transaction will not unlock, will not, will not close unless you close it explicitly. So then we've got the wait parameter. And this defines how long I'm prepared to wait to get the lock in the first place. So you really do need to tune this one to your use case. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And the retry defines how often should I try again? Because what it's doing is it's actually polling and asking for the, this lock. So if the re resource was already locked, how often should another attempt be made to get a lock on that resource? And again, this should be tuned based on the normal amount of time a lock should be held. And we'll discuss why that is in just a second. So there's a bunch of considerations we should take with these parameters. So you've got to be careful if you expect high contention for particular resources. Now, remember here that we're not locking everything. Every resource, which will have an ID or a name, is separate. So you can lock different things in independently. So in most systems, of where you're using distributed locking, it's unlikely you'll have a collision. And in these scenarios, the retry time should be, you know, a bit more than half the typical lock length, because that'll mean, you know, the lock will probably be obtained pretty much straight after the, the caller that already had the lock has finished. But, in cases where the contention is really high, you've got to be careful to handle the case where you lock, you couldn't even have paying the lock because that's actually not an unusual case. So if I'm waiting, you know, 30 seconds, prepared to wait 30 seconds to get the lock and I'm trying every three seconds, it's conceivable that I've tried 10 times, but every time I tried, it was locked. So you've got to be much more careful to handle those case cases, and you need to be much more concrete in what happens here. Okay, so let's have a, a look at that use case in action in the code. So, here we have one of these red locks being created. So as you can see, we create a lock. Uh, what are some of the other things we do here? We check whether we got the lock. Then we're gonna do some stuff. And of course, yeah, we've gotta do something about the case where we didn't get a lock. And finally, we need to release the lock. Now the other stuff that's in here that I might point out is we're trying to do some timings here as well. So I want to know how long does it take me to get a lock? So here's our dependency service and that dependency factory we created earlier. So I just say dependency factory dot get dependency we're inside a, a, something called a lock service and we're trying to acquire a lock. And the ID happens to be the ID of the lock I'm trying to acquire. And I've now got a dependency. So what I do is I await the create and here 
I assign the success based on whether I actually got the lock or not. And here I'm calling dispose manually. But for an example of how to use this as you would normally use it, I've just got a using clause and then all it's going to do is this release here is going to time how long it took to call that dispose method. So that gives us nice timings of things. So yeah, there was, a, that, there was quite a lot of code there, wasn't there, just to do our locking. How about we make that a bit nicer? Because it's, I'm not a big fan of wordy code. Everywhere I see stuff that I'm going to be doing boilerplate, I extract it out a bit. And we have to think about what the use case here is. Typically, we just want to run a block of code, and it's going to be a consistent block of code while we're locked. And it might have a return value. So my next step was I built an interface and said, I want to have a locking service where I can call perform while locked and I can either provide an ID or a custom class called a lock token. And what will happen is it will call a function that passes in a lock token and returns a task and that function is called do stuff. And I can either return a bool or I can return a type if that function was actually supposed to return data. Okay, so that lock token, what's that for? So the key, the thing here is our lock token can wrap the ID of the resource where we're locking. So that means that the code that's in that do stuff method can actually check that we lock the correct resource before doing it right. And we'll see an example of this in the, the code we're, we're going to show. Okay. So do, this do stuff method is the code we want to do while we have the item locked. So it makes it a nice, easy pattern to reuse. Okay, so we saw that lock service code before. And now we, here's the interface. And you'll see we've got a string lock token. So this is showing you how that, that lock token works. Inside, it's just got a string. And let's have a look at how it all ends up. So here we are, we're in a, a function on our, um, our context where we're trying to update the current information. And it's for an individual city in that population model. So you'll see we've got the city name, and that sounds like a great token or ID to use for identifying what we'd like to lock. And then we've got an integer saying how many more kangaroos there are or less, how many more or less humans there are, and how many more or less zombies. So we want to time this whole thing. So we've got a using with our dependency saying cosmos.update current information, and we've recorded the city name so we know what city was actually locked. And then here's our perform while locked on our lock service. So to have to run some code while something's locked, the easiest way to do it is with a lambda method just like this. So we can perform while locked and what we can see it does is it goes and gets the city. So that goes and retrieves the city, that particular city's data from Cosmos. It makes the changes we asked for, and then it waits for the city to be updated. But you'll notice here that we've used that lock token and we've passed it through. So why have I passed that through? So my update city method actually takes the city it's going to update and the lock token and one of the things it can do is check that I've actually got a lock on the city I'm about to, to write. So that's really cool. 
that's something you don't get in other solutions like this. You don't know, you can't check whether you've actually locked the right thing. So it is actually quite a common error when you're implementing these things to actually lock the wrong record and make an update on a different record. So we, we've seen how that worked in Cosmos. Let's compare that to the same code to do that against SQL Server. So if we come back again, we've got our Cosmos Apocalypse Cosmos context, which writes data into Cosmos. And I'll go back to the previous code so you can see how similar this looks, and we'll do a bit of a, a comparison. So again, I've got a dependency around it. I want my reads to be repeatable. So I've created a brand new transaction. Looks fairly similar to our lock, doesn't it? So we're, and then we're going to get the city, make the changes, save the changes to the records, and wait for the commit. And if something goes wrong, we can roll back. Unfortunately, we don't have that in our Cosmos, the rollback, but we could potentially implement that. But otherwise, this code looks remarkably similar. But the next question is, will it behave just as you would? Um, will it behave as well as the Cosmos one? Or will the SQL Server one be more effective? Now you notice we had to set the isolation level correctly for SQL Server, or things won't work as you expect. But we had to implement our locking the way we wanted it to work. We could have implemented a repeatable, a, um, an exclusive lock or a shared lock. We actually implemented a, an exclusive lock there because no one ever reads without taking out a lock there. But we could have implemented the other just by changing when we locked things in that example. So, we've now written some code. Let's see how it performed. So, first of all, this is the um, method uh, that updates all of the cities. So this was the, the update your entire model, the population model. And if we take a look, we'll see that this is in milliseconds. It typically takes about two and a half seconds to update the population model for the SQL Server version. And then we've got this light blue line right down the bottom at about 300 milliseconds. So it was only taking 300 milliseconds to do the same thing in Cosmos. Okay, that's a much bigger difference than I expected. Okay, I'm not sure I got this right when I first saw this. So the second thing I did was let we've got timings on the individual cities. So let's have a look at how long it took to update one city. And like the graphs look similar, but if you look more closely, this time it's the Cosmos record that takes ages to update, whereas the SQL Server one's taking like 30 milliseconds. So it takes longer to update a Cosmos, an individual Cosmos record than it does to do a SQL Server record, but we've got like 200 cities. But why does the Cosmos run faster when we update everything? Well, we also got some really good telemetry of what's going on. So if we look here, we can see an awful lot of what's going on. So we can see that when we calculate everything, we get into this calculate cosmos method, which then starts running this calculate method, which first thing it does is it goes and reads the list of cities that we and that's what we expected. We knew it was gonna read the list of cities, so it knew which ones to update. The next thing it did is it called this calculate city method, took out a lock, acquired, the, and then you can see how long it took to acquire the lock, 
how long it spent in that get city method when it tried to read it, how long it took to update it, and how long it took to release it. And all of that inside that one lock took about 140 milliseconds. We look at the second one, it looks almost like the first one. But you'll notice that the first one is directly underneath the second one. So what happened? We can see here that all of these are executing in parallel. So with Cosmos, we were able to update every record in parallel. However, if we take a look here, and it really shows up nicely on App Insights, you can see how it tracks across the screen. That's because it's executing in serial. And while SQL Server would let us do this parallel, if you're using an a, a, um, ORM like Entity Framework, typically they're not thread safe, so you can't execute multiple queries on the same set of entities simultaneously. So I can't do this in parallel easily without jumping through lots of hoops. But as you can see, that application insights telemetry made it really easy for us to see what was going on in our code. So if you are interested in this demo and um, finding out all of the ways it was done, there's also an Azure deployment script that makes it nice and easy to deploy an Azure function and Cosmos and Redis. So it's a great example of if you want to get started. Uh, lots of people took that when I presented, downloaded that when I presented it in, this at NDC. So feel free to grab that code. Remember, if there are too many locks, there will never be enough keys. Okay, so I told you at the start that we, we've got a, some rewards. If you scan that QR code, you can have 500 points for scanning that, that code there. I love feedback, so I'd love you to scan the QR code on the screen now and give me some great feedback so that I can uh, improve this presentation because I'm going to be presenting this at a few other places. So just in summary, we covered locking in general. And while the example I've given you here was Cosmos, there's loads of other use cases for this. You can use this anywhere where you need a distributed lock. So be really clear on what it is uh, of other that this thing will work everywhere you need a lock. The other thing I think we really demonstrated here is that debugging using application insights and working out what might be going on is super easy with that Gantt view that they've got there and that is really, really useful. And the demo here really showed that to a T. Thank you very much for listening. All right, so I have a bunch of people that have sent me some questions. You happy to answer some questions before yes. I ask you? Costi, go on. Yes. What is it? So um, Costa's asking really, is that if you've got say 10 people trying to get the lock, will they get the lock in the order that they tried to get the lock? So will the first person in, if you were thinking of it as a queue, Will the first person in the queue get it, then the second person, then the third person? And typically with distributed locks, the answer is probably not. And in this case, absolutely not. No, there's no guarantee that, you know, if you were the first, the second person and it was already locked, that you'll be the second person to get that lock. So it's really just luck at that point. And the, the, the the benefit you get from that is that you'll get a response back and you can go off and do other work while you're waiting for that lock. So there are advantages in that not working that way, as well as disadvantages. All right, so I got a, thanks for repeating the question from Brisbane. Uh, I got another one who really enjoyed your presentation. Do you think Cosmos will ever get out of the box locking? I kind of think that's unlikely just because it's 
the key thing that they dropped to be able to get all of the the really big features they've got. I mean, it's possible, but I, I find it unlikely that they'll be able to, to get out of that. Okay. I've got another question firing in from Brisbane. What's the best ORM to use Cosmos with, or should we use native Cosmos SDKs? Well, I mean, the, the common reason you're using Cosmos is that you've got what a potentially um, different object model. So quite often you wouldn't use an ORM. I wouldn't use an ORM. I typically use a native, use the native Cosmos SDKs because they, they're, and they're fairly powerful already. The other thing is that the ORMs tend to be fairly focused on the um, relational type operations. But um, Entity Framework does a reasonable job. It's certainly the best of the other ones of the ORMs that I'm aware of that allow you to use Cosmos. Okay. So I uh, got another one. In what situations would I want to get a lock asynchronously? via create lock async? Well, I mean, this example was great because it showed you the exact scenario. I want to do lots of operations. I don't want to have to, you know, yield my thread permanently while I wait to get my lock, which might be 60 seconds. So I could block a thread for 60 seconds if I'm not doing that asynchronously. If I do it asynchronously, I send off the request I go off and do other work, and then when I get the lock, I continue from where I was. So that's a much more efficient way of doing things. It means I can handle many more requests than I would otherwise. Okay. So I'm going to group a few questions together here. Okay. What type of um, Azure bill have you seen? Second, oh. uh, hold on. If I implement your code and make um, implement this code and add locks, Will my Azure bill change? And the other one, which is related, how much is it going to cost me to do Cosmos locking via Redis? Okay, so the, there's a few things there. I mean, I can give you, I've seen customers spend upwards of $100,000 a month on Cosmos. So you can spend an awful lot of money on Cosmos if you've got the data. That's more than a million bucks a year. That's right. Wow, must be so, rich. <laughs> well, hope they're making a lot of money. It's all about how much their customers are prepared to pay for what's being used on that. But conversely here, we can also spend very, very little. So the minimum number of RUs, which is the, the units that Cosmos uh, uses to charge, cost about, uh, I think it's $8 Australian a month to have the minimum number of RUs. And depending on what you're actually writing in your Cosmos database, an awful lot of customers of Cosmos only need the minimum I use. They've just got small numbers of documents and they're just using it because it's a convenient and easy way to, to manage stuff. Right, but to get back to the, the one of the questions, if I implement your code tonight, will my Azure bill change? Uh, I wouldn't expect you would actually change your Azure bill other than the fact that if you already had Cosmos and you already had Redis. If you, you use Redis, it's about $50 a month roughly. Okay. And the Cosmos might be $5. So my, when I was um, had this example up and running, it was costing me something of the order of $3 a day to, to do the benchmarking that you saw there. Okay, cool. Uh, let's assume I'm a typical web developer. What are some common scenarios where I should think about adding locking? Okay, so um, the most common one I would think of would be I'm building a web sales site. And, you know, I get, I'm trying to sell actual things as opposed to, you know, web services. If I'm selling, say, chairs, and I've got a hundred chairs in the website, I would want to lock the, the, the table that's got the count of how many cha chairs I've got while I update the number of chairs. Otherwise, what will happen is I'll uh, have 100 chairs, one person will order four chairs, one person will order five chairs, and we'll 
both of us will come in and say, oh, there's 100 chairs. So I'll write note, the first one who's getting four chairs will write, oh, there's 96 chairs left. And the other one will go, all right, there are 100. I've just bought five. I'll write 95 back into the database. And we've either got 96 or 95 sitting in this database when really there should be 91 because we've sold nine. So that's where you need the locking for, is to make sure things like inventory, um, account information, like if you've got a customer who has an amount of money in an account, you want to update that account within a lock. Typically you would do it in a SQL Server transaction or a SQL transaction on a, a, a relational database. But if you were storing that data in a document database like Cosmos, you'd need to do the locking yourself like we, we've demonstrated here. Okay. If early on in the customer scenario, you're, they're telling you in, in the initial meetings, this is what they want with locking, would you always choose SQL from that point? Because you kind of know that's what they're after. Well, it would depend on things like um, how much data they had, what the type of data, like if it had no relational structure, but they wanted to be able to lock things, a SQL based database might be a problem. So something like Cosmos would be perfect there. Like if you had, if that, rather than have, it was a, a bank account mm. and the bank account wasn't actually just in a table, it was they just sent you their statement and the statements were the documents and they each came from different banks. I'd have to find things in those statements and modify them. And they all look different. So that wouldn't go into a relational database well. Right. So it's really horses for courses. Okay. Um, any other questions from you guys? No, I'll take one more. And that is, this is about performance. If we did a custom implementation of locking for SQL Server, how much would the performance compare with the out-of-the-box performance? I think we'd struggle to do better than the, the out-of-the-box performance for SQL Server because, I mean, they've spent, effectively, that's their bread and butter. They've spent years and years finding every tiny little optimization that they can find where if we're building it ourselves, we're going to be doing it pretty primitively. Right. And they've got access to, you know, page level locks. We wouldn't be able to lock at the page level because we don't know where the data's stored in pages and stuff. Right. So if we're updating multiple records, we've just got to lock the whole table. So I can't see any way we could beat, right. you know, a standard relational database. Right. Okay. All right. Well, I think that was fantastic. It's great um, hearing some of those uh, answers. Um, uh, the, I hope you've had a good night. The news generated quite a bit of uh, uh, comments to me about the sponsor, you know, the, the dude that made his, his GitHub project private and then told everyone to purchase it. Uh, fun story. And thanks, um, Bryden, for a great uh, session on Cosmos Locking. Um, this is Adam Kogan uh, signing off for SSW TV. Thank you.